Hey everyone, welcome to People Are the Worst podcast, run by two twins. I'm just going to start giving this spiel all over again. The whole thing. Well, we might have new listeners. You never know. Oh yeah, no, we definitely do. Um, well, where we hate people because they're they're the worst at their core. Mm-hmm. It's true. Not y'all. No, not y'all. They um are the worst, and this podcast here is to explain why via storytelling and (laughs) and facts and facts and totally unbiased journalism (laughs) we are we really are middle of the road you know (laughs) psych sometimes we are just sometimes not against people like you're on vandersloot oh please and every single person we've done a story about (laughs) that's true um and our whole thing is we love a plot twist. We love a shock factor. We hate old timey murders. Look, sorry. Yeah. We are just never going to. Oh my God. I was listening. I was on a road trip and I was driving and by myself, which is a pure effing luxury. You know, oh what my I mean? God. No kids? Nothing. Well, no kids, but they're dead asleep. So, you know. Oh, uh, totally. So it's practically I was alone. And if they were to wake up, I was just going to stick an iPad in their face anyway. Um, totally. And I was like, okay, let me, I want to see a true crime. And I went through Apple's, like, you know, top charts, whatever. And I scrolled through some episodes and I was like, we have an old timey one for you in 1842. I was like, oh my God. This On the Apple f- charts? Yeah. There are a few like that. Well, it was a um, top charted podcast. And I scrolled oh, okay. through their episodes. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and there were a couple like that. And I was like, oh, my God. Do people like old yeah. timey? Some people do. Uh, can someone explain that to me? If you are one of them, we'd love to hear why. I think it's because. Okay. I've, I don't know if I read this on Reddit or somewhere, but I think it's because it disconnects, disconnects them so much from the victims and all that. Because uh, it was so long ago. Like, they don't feel like. There's a level of, I don't know, disconnection. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. There's less emotional attachment yeah. to those stories because, yeah, because they're, there's also um, less interest <laughs> on my end, at least. I'm sorry. Look, it's what they did. I just, I know, especially you OGs, you know, you've heard our spiel about it, but we might have new listeners who have not heard the first 10 episodes. I don't know. I have seen a lot more on podcasts doing older ones like that. Maybe we'll eventually be into it. Maybe it'll intrigue me one day, not yeah. today. Well, and I also like the investigation. Yeah. The, the modern day d- yeah. investigation. They didn't That's have true. that back then. It's like, uh, I don't know. There's there. I, I just can't imagine how there's much to it. Right. Someone, yeah, shot a salesman. That's it. And a neighbor saw. And so they went and shot that guy, the one deputy in town. Yeah. And Figured through out. word of mouth, they found him and they hung him. Yeah. And I'm like, what? In the down center. <laughs> yeah. Because there's no, in the down center in front of everyone. And there's like, there's no science behind it. It's like, well, someone said he saw him. And that's it. Yeah. There I'm you like, go. Well, that's, there. There's your old timey murder. Too much. Yeah, John. Thank y'all for listening. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> We're the worst. <laughs> we, we would be the worst. Okay. All right, Rach. What are you telling me about today? All right, I'm going to tell y'all about Kit Martin. Sources, a book called I Will Ruin You by Emilio Corsetti oh. III, KentuckyNewEra.com, USA Today, The Case File, and Dateline. Is Emilio the uh, murderer? Sounds <laughs> no. like it. No. Mm. He just has some real strong opinions. <laughs> Clearly. In 2004, 32-year-old Joan Harmon was a single mom of three, and she had had a very rough couple of years. Her seven-year-old son's dad, Michael, was killed in a logging accident in Oregon. He was actually mm-hmm. decapitated. Oh, God. After that, she met and married a man named Carlos. They had two daughters together, but Carlos became abusive. So when their daughters were just two years old and nine months old, Joan took them and left. Good for her. Yeah. So she had a sad story, but in 2004, she was ready to get back out there. And so she posted on Yahoo Personals, which I didn't didn't even know that was a thing. Me or, neither. Or was a thing. I don't know. That's where she met a man named Christian Martin, who everyone called Kit. Kit was an Apache helicopter pilot in the Army and was retired, but had recently decided to go back into active duty. 
He was 35 years old and also a single dad to three kids, and he and Joan really hit it off. They started dating, and things got serious pretty quickly. Since Kit was back in active duty, he knew that he would likely be sent overseas. So in December 2004, he and Joan went to the courthouse and got married after only dating for a couple of months. Oh, my God. And then he's going overseas, so she's there with six kids. No, well, his three kids lived with his ex-wife. Oh, okay. And they're a little older, but yeah, they had uh, her three kids. Yeah. But no, she's going with him. <laughs> they're <laughs> married. They're moving. Okay. Anyway, let me just get to it. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's Monday night. Oh my God. Our poor editor and producer. <sighs> he can, he must hate a Monday night recording. I know. I know I do. I read through it first for that exact reason. Yeah. Cobwebs. Tired. Cobwebs up here. So stupid yeah. com comments coming at you. Wasn't the first, won't be the last. you damn right. And there's there are a lot of players in this story. Sorry in advance. Oh, Jesus. I'll be very clear. Well, Kit already sounds like a woman's name, so I wish you, we could just call him Christian to keep my mind straight, but whatever. No, you got this. Kit Martin. Oh, God. As expected, Kit was assigned to Germany. So in hmm. 2005, he, Joan, and Joan's three kids moved there. Fine. He didn't move there solo. He took the family. <laughs> Why? <laughs> While overseas, he served three tours in Iraq. And in 2010, they moved to Newport, Rhode Island, so Kate could get his master's in national defense at the Naval War College. Mm. After that, he reached the rank of a major, which is a big deal up in here. Sure. And he was assigned to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They bought a house in nearby Pembroke, Kentucky, and that's where the rest of this story takes place. Okay. I swear, the more I research for this podcast, Kentucky might be the new Florida. Florida. <laughs> wow. I was, all, I was hesitant is, to say folks. it. I was hesitant to say it, but you get it. Y'all get it. But it is, I mean, a lot of places, a lot of murders take place, and I'm like... Where is this? Oh, it's K Kentucky. Kentucky, again. eh? I don't find that, but oh, sure. God. Okay. I mean, I mean, I got this one, but I can't think of another. Mm, okay. So they moved to Kentucky. They're happy. They're great. This is farm country. So they bought an old fixer-upper with a ton of acreage. About a year after the move, Joan and Kit started fighting a lot, though, especially oh. about finances. Oh. For most of their years together, Kit was deployed or on base or you know, they weren't together that much. So this is the first time they're actually spending time together and they don't like it. No, sure. It is a tough transition, I'm sure. Yeah. So they, they fight, they argue a lot about, again, especially about finances. Things really came to a blow one night in 2012 when they were fighting and Joan ended up calling the police for domestic abuse. Oh. He had been threatening her and poking her in the head when all the kids were there. Wait, hold on. I'm so sorry. Poking her in the head? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I have something to add. Well, okay. yes. Yes. Poking her in the head, you know, in the like side of the head. Like a nuisance? Like a two-year-old little obnoxious little shit? I think in an aggressive way. If he's, if someone's yelling in your face and like, I don't know. I don't know. But he, Kit told the cops that he was not poking her in the head, actually. He said he only flicked her hair when they were arguing. Which, Wait. I gotta say, that is an aggressive thing to do. Hold on. I got to think. I got to put myself in the situation. Flicks my hair. I'd be like, what the hell was that? Think <laughs> about someone being furious at you, though. It's bare. Think about your husband. Paint it this to me. I'd be, like, I'd be nervous <laughs> that he's about to snap. Yeah. You're, you're arguing. It's getting pretty heated. And he comes over and flicks you, your hair. I think that's a very aggressive move. No. Yeah, I guess. Because it is like. You're at your wits end and you, yeah. you don't know what else to do. You're not going to hit me, but you are. That's the thing. That's the only thing you can think of is to flick my hair. Uh, I yes. cannot decide if I'd be like, what the hell was that? Or no, I think terrifying. it'd be one step before him just snapping. That's just such a, I don't know. It just is really aggressive yeah. to me. Okay. So, so he, he says he did that, but he did not, you know, poke her in the head or hit her or anything. Apparently, though, this was not the first time things got physical. Joan's son would later say that while Kit put on a very good front in public, he was horrible behind closed doors and mm. abused him and his sisters, Aww. both physically and sexually. That's Ooh, what he no, said. no. Ew. Yeah. And how old are they? I'm so sorry. Sorry, everyone. Uh, 
at this point, when they got ma- when they met, he was seven. Okay. S- at this point, seven, two, and nine months. I mean, when they met, sorry, when they met, seven, two, and nine months. This was eight years later, so I think he's he's fourteen uh, ish. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's 15. 17 years later. I mean, seven years later. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's 14-ish. Sorry for that long-winded math. There it is. This fight in 2012 was the straw that broke the camel's back. They started the divorce process, and Joan got an emergency protective order against Kit. She also called the Family Advocacy Program at Fort Campbell to report him for domestic abuse, and they started an investigation. Oh, yeah. You're, mm-hmm. You're in the military, sir simply won't fly well it's really it shouldn't fly no it shouldn't, <laughs> i mean it doesn't they, fly for anyone but it doesn't fly for anyone but they have their own court okay we'll get there with the pending divorce kit stayed in their house and joan had to find a new place to live with her kids they stayed at a nearby shelter for victims of domestic violence called the sanctuary but that was temporary and she had been a stay-at-home mom for like 10 years at this point oh, so God. she had no money yeah. She was getting some spousal support from Kit. The court ordered that he pay about $450 a month. Ooh. And I think she may have gotten some benefits from the army while the divorce was pending. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. But she was in no position to up and buy a house. So yeah. their across the street neighbors, Cal and Pam Phillips, let her and the kids move into their rental unit for $212 a month. They really it took takes her a village. I know. It really does. That is so nice. I know. Cal and Pam, and I'm just going to point this out because I've heard that we have Southern accents. I'm saying Cal, C-A-L, not Kyle. I don't know why people think that. We're from Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> We're from Canada. Yeah. Eh? Cal and Pam were a married couple in their 50s who Joan had been spending a lot of time with. They met them, Joan and Kit met them when they moved in, and they just hit it off. Cal was a logistics officer in the military for 17 years, so they had that in common. But he was retired now, and Pam was the VP at a local bank. Oh, okay. On December 6, 2012, Joan asked Cal to help her move some of her stuff out of the old house while Kit was gone. While they were there, she grabbed a box of her grandmother's old quilts, and she realized that wrapped up in the quilts was a laptop and a bunch of CDs. Oh, shit. She didn't know what they were, but when Cal saw that some of the CDs had classified on it, and there was Uh also some that said secret and one that said secret operation. Oh, shit. As a former logistics officer in the Army, Cal was like, no, no. He should not have these. These belong to the army and they should not be in, you know, someone's personal house. Right. So he took them and turned them into the FBI and reported Kit for not only having these classified documents, but also told them about a picture he saw when he was over there helping her move. Joan had shown him a picture of her son, Justin, his shirt's off and he's, it's his back and he's covered in bruises. It looks like switches. (gasps) It looks like he was whipped. You've seen this? Uh Uh-huh. What the hell is wrong with you? I know. I didn't mean to. It wasn't up to me. Oh, my God, Justin. So she showed Cal this picture. And so while he was turning in the classified documents, he said, and by the way, I saw a picture and I believe there's abuse. (sighs) So now, in addition to their investigation into child abuse, the Army counterintelligence starts surveilling Kit. Mm -hmm. When the investigator questioned Joan about her and Kit's time overseas, She told them that when they lived in Germany, they traveled around Europe a lot, and Kit would often disappear anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, but would never say where he was going or what he was doing. Army counterintelligence found that Kit downloaded classified information to his personal laptop while stationed in the Middle East. The laptops and thumb drives were later taken with him to Germany, and then Rhode Island, and then Pembroke, Kentucky. Oh, no. But he, at this point, didn't have permission to travel with this information anymore. So he is in huge trouble. Yeah. Among the items he had downloaded was a kill list, which (gasps) is a list of people U.S. forces can shoot on site or capture and who authorized them to be on that list. Uh What if someone found that? Also, can I see it? Can I see it? I want to see it. Oh, my God. Wait. So it could be like, 
it has the person you can kill and who authorized it. So back in the day, it would be like Osama bin Laden. Everyone authorizes it. <laughs> USA. USA authorizes it. Like that? Yes. But I think, no, I actually think it was more so who's on the list, who they can kill or capture, and then who can authorize it. Oh, my God. That is so like interesting. How, do we know how many people were on But it, it? might have been who authorized it. That makes actually more sense because uh, whatever. I don't, they don't want it out. They don't no. want it out. No, that seems very top secret. It's very top secret. The investigator said this wasn't just lower lower level battalion stuff he was taking. This was CIA stuff. Sure. That's a hard pass. Mm -hmm. So with this, the worst thing that can happen to an army major was going to happen. Court martial. Mm. For those not in the U.S., court martial is our military's highest level of trial court for members who are accused of breaking military law. And for some of you in the U.S. <laughs> and for, yeah, sure, sure. We don't know what you don't know. Come on. Listen, who am I to assume? Right. Kit was charged with violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice for sexual assault, other assault charges, conduct on becoming an officer, mishandling classified information, and communicating a threat. After years of delays, his court-martial trial is set for the first week of December 2015. Okay. So it was like three years later. Yeah. Kit is fighting this tooth and nail and even hires his own private investigator named Mary Martin to see if she can find anything that would discredit Joan and or Cal. No he relation. Knew, huh? No relation. What? Isn't that Kit Martin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice that. Uh-huh. How did okay. I not notice that? Not sure. But I'm here. Y'all, I'm here all week. Oh, my God. Yeah. that is. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> well i just i kept calling her the pi but she was in it more than i thought so i threw her name in there today oh anyway. okay well lucky you have me yeah really so he wants this pi to dig in and see if she can find anything to discredit joan or cal because he knew they were going to be the star witnesses so he needed to make them seem like liars pretty much yeah then on november 18th 2015 Pam Phillips, Cal's wife, left for work and gave Cal one job for the day. Be on the lookout for the new washing machine that was supposed to be delivered. He's like, uh -huh. got it. Mm -hmm. Around noon, the delivery people called her and said that they could not deliver the washing machine because no one's home. And oh she's my God. pissed. Hold on to your freaking hat. Pissed. Yeah. So she calls Cal and he doesn't answer she keeps calling him and still nothing. So now she's getting worried. She's yeah. not pissed. Right. She decides to leave work early and check on him. And on her way home, she called one of their other neighbors, Ed Danzero, and told him that she can't get in touch with Cal and was worried. She was just giving him a heads up. And yeah. I, I think, I mean, I believe probably asking him to go over and check. I don't know. Yeah. When she gets home, Cal isn't there, and she plays the messages on their answering machine, and here's a message from their good friend Marlene. She called Marlene to ask if she talked to Cal, if he ever called her back, or knew where he was, and Marlene said no. She actually called him early to check on him because they had a really sick dog, like likely going to die, and he was really upset. So she called Aww. to check on him. He didn't answer. Aww. So she went by the house around 2 p.m. and noticed that the front door was wide open. Ooh. She figured he was in the back in the field behind their house working. So she was like, I'll just check in later. As Marlene is telling her this, Pam is walking through the house and tells Marlene to stay on the phone because she thinks she just saw something. No. Mm -mm. Then Marlene Bullshit. heard her scream and hang up. It went silent. Oh, that is How terrifying. Terrifying is that? I can't believe she walked around the house by herself. Ooh, uh, uh, uh. I kind of get there in a in a minute, but. This house is an old, historic, beautiful mansion. Oh, my God. Haunted for sure. Uh-huh. I would have been so scared to walk around. Right. But anyway, Marlene jumped in her car after this, after the scream and hang up, and went over to the Phillips house to check on them. And when she got there, Pam's car was in the driveway, parts how it always is, and the front door was wide open. She went to the doorway and yelled, but nobody came, and she was scared to go inside, so she left. Went back an hour later, and this time the door was closed, uh -uh. and Pam's car was facing a different direction. 
No, this seems like a job for someone else. I wish you could just like call someone to come look at this for you. I know she is so sweet in the interview I watched. I, I, she just because this is gonna really piss you off. That you... she doesn't ever call the police. She did not call. She said she knew something was off, and that's why she didn't go inside. But it, she didn't think it was a situation for police. What? It's oh I don't my... know. Oh uh, no, I'm not true. No, I am. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to sugarcoat that, but no, she should have, but that's okay. Well, yeah. If you're scared, sure. if you're too scared to go inside a house you and your gut is saying something's wrong, just call the police. It's not dramatic. It's not, come on. That's what they're there for. I know. I mean, yeah. And, and when you learn what we learn in the story, obviously she should have called the police. Anyway, sure. a few hours later at 2.15 a.m., very early the next morning, mm. a nearby resident was awoken by the sound of two explosions that sounded like they were coming from his farm. Ooh. He thought it may be some hunters on his property, so he didn't go out and investigate. I think this was pretty common. When he woke up for the day a few hours later, there was a car in his field, and it was on fire. Ooh. So he called the police. The, it's about the time. Fire. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So he I'm shut just the kidding. curtains and said, I'm going to mind my business. <laughs> I don't scared. want to be dramatic. I'm just going to mind my business now. Yeah. The fire department got there and noted a strong smell of kerosene. Oh. Once it was extinguished, they realized there were two bodies in there. Mm. It was a man and a woman. Both had been shot several times with a 22 caliber gun, and the bodies were severely burned. Oh, shit. Luckily, the license plate hadn't burned, so they ran it, and the car was registered to Pam Phillips. Oh, uh, the neighbor who lit Jones Day. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Later, they identified Pam as the woman found in the car, but they still didn't know who the man was. Investigators go over to Pam's house and see a pool of blood in the front yard. Oh, shit. They get a search warrant and go inside, and they find Cal dead <gasps> at the bottom of the basement stairs. Oh. He had also been shot several times, but with a forty five caliber gun. And it looks like the killer tried to set him on fire as well, but it didn't work. Oh, gross. They searched the property, and in the yard they find a cell phone and a gun. The phone was close to the neighbor's house, Ed, the one Pam called on her way home. Mm -hmm. Ed lived alone, and when they went to get the phone from the grass, they realized that his back door was wide open. Oh, no. It's like a serial killer in this small little town. I know. They looked in, and there was a prepared meal on the kitchen counter and a full open beer. But he was not there. Oh. And Ed's chair was an empty gun holster. Oh. By now, word is spreading throughout this small town that three dead bodies have been found. Marlene, the friend that went and checked and saw that the door was open, didn't go inside, didn't call the cops. As word spreading about this, she, did, she called the police and told them about the call with Pam with the scream and then silence. Mm -hmm. And this helps form their theory that maybe Ed, the neighbor, sat to eat dinner, heard the same scream, grabbed oh. his gun, ran out to check on Pam, encountered the murderer, and was likely the person who was in the car with Pam. Oh. When they found it, they asked Ed's girlfriend who lived like an hour away. They asked her if he had ever had surgery. And when she told him that he had a metal rod in his leg from a surgery a few, few years back, they said, this is probably him. Oh. I guess they found them that Wait, rod. so this guy, this killer, they think they shot them in the house and then, like, carried them to the car and drove them to? Um, well, I will get kind of to there. Oh. Chill. Okay. It was also Ed's cell phone and his gun they found in the front yard. Oh. The blood found in the yard was both his and Pam's. Sad. Okay, um, so they were definitely shot in the front yard. Yeah. Sorry, I took a pause because I was like, oh, my God, that's so nice that a neighbor, that is so neighborly. Totally. I mean, he did not mind his own business. He got involved. Yeah, he did. Oh, I know. I know. Later that night, Pam and Cal's adult son, Matt, who lived in Louisville, went to meet a friend for dinner, knowing nothing about what's going oh, on in his hometown. He said when he got to the restaurant, his friend looked really sad. And Matt was like, what's wrong? And his friend showed him an article on his phone with the headline that there was a triple murder in Pembroke. And the no. picture under it was a picture of his house, his childhood home with caution tape around it, and a picture of his mom's burned car. Can what? you imagine finding out like that? 
What? The way? He has a cell phone? What? How? What year is this? What are we 2015? It's 2015. But right. it, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, my. They hadn't God. released. They hadn't identified him yet. Yeah. Okay. They just yeah, knew yeah, yeah. where they found him. That's but true, he okay. knew those cars. He knew that house. I mean, that he knew that car. He knew that house. He knew yeah, but, them. Yeah. They didn't I say names. I can't believe with all the small town whispers and everything, no one thought to call their children and beg just a heads up. Marlene, where the fuck are you? You're not calling the cops. You're not notifying the kids. Well, come on. It was it was the same day. I mean, he found out this could have been a happy hour dinner. I don't know. All right. It could have been early. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, know. he found out I like know. that. Sorry, Marlene's been through enough. But I know. If they're like really good friends, I'm like, how is she not like? Oh God, I've got to call the kids to get home. I don't know. Because they haven't identified him yet. I mean, that's not her place to do it. They need to notify. No, next you're right. To all right. Matt called his aunt and then got in his car and drove all night to Michigan so he could break the news to his grandparents. No. I know. Isn't that so sad? Oh, my God. So then he goes to Pembroke. It's spelled Pembroke. I think it's Pembroke. Um, so I'm just going to do that. And a few days after the murders... Literally, I think two days after the murders, the police tell Matt that they are releasing the house to him. They gathered the evidence they could, and now they were done. And again, this is where I was going to tell you, this house is huge. It is a old, like, antebellum mansion in Kentucky. Oh, God. It's very pretty, amazing. but it's not, that was a lot quicker of a turnaround than you yeah, would think. Right. And there is a ton of stuff in it. So they hand the house, the house back over and say essentially it's not an active crime scene anymore and matt and his aunt do what you do in this situation you start cleaning it out a few days later as they're continuing to clean it out the police come back to the house and tell matt that they need to test it for test the floors for blood what matt's like what we've contaminated the shit yeah. out of this place but sure Why now go ahead sure they test a part of the floor near the phone and find Pam's blood soaked into the floorboards. Oh. They also find a couple of strands of her hair. So the hmm. police are like, okay, great. Got it. Thank you so much. You can have the house back again. So Matt and the aunt continue cleaning. And a few days after that, no. while sweeping the kitchen floor, hey, what's that in the dustpan? It's oh. a twenty two caliber shell casing. No. They turned it into police, and I'm sure they're very frustrated by now. Because remember... Pam and Ed were shot by 22. Cal was shot oh, by 45. Right. Mm -hmm. And this was a what? 22. Okay. They continue cleaning, and the aunt reaches on top of a bookshelf and feels army dog tags. And she actually starts crying because it was one of the last mementos from her brother, Cal. Oh. She hands them to Matt, and he looks at them and says, these aren't dads. Oh. The name on the dog tags was Kit Martin. <laughs> they knew kit obviously all the neighbors knew each other and they were like why are his dog tags here this really piques the investigators interest because cal was one of the key witnesses to testify in kit's upcoming court martial oh yeah, yeah, yeah which again was set for the first week of december 2015 and the murders were on november 18th 2015 uh, well, i mean two mm, weeks ish yeah before his court mar martial so talk mm -hmm. about a motive to kill Right. And perhaps Pam and Ed were just collateral damage. That's Aww. what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. Investigators get a search warrant for Kit's house, and special agents went to the base to question him. Kit said he had nothing to do with this. He had no reason to want Cal dead, actually just the opposite. He had subpoenaed Cal to testify at the court-martial. He needed him there. Why? Because Cal switched sides. He was going to testify for Kit against Joan. <gasps> But Cal was with Joan when they found all that crap. I know. I got mm. mm. So Kit is telling the police that Joan is behind all of this. He says that the abuse allegations are bullshit. He thinks mm -hmm. she stole the laptop and disc from his military office and took them back to their house. And he thinks she's behind the murders and is framing him because she benefited more from Cal being dead. Not him. Uh, Here's wait, why okay. Kit was so certain that Cal was flipping on Joan. Remember back in 2014, he hired Mary Martin, the private investigator. 
yeah. to see if she could discredit Joan's testimony. Yeah. Well, Mary started digging into Joan's previous relationships. Remember, divorce from an abuser, and before that, her son's dad was killed in an accident. Uh-uh. One day, Mary called Kit and said, no, her son's dad was not decapitated. His head is still intact. Oh, my and God, his head's still attached. <laughs> and it's upright because he's alive. <laughs> it's upright. <laughs> Except when he's looking down. <laughs> yeah. Or sleeping. But all in all, it's on there. And he is alive. Oh, my God. She also spoke to the other father of her children, Carlos, the abusive monster. And not only did he deny the abuse, but he and Joan are still married. <gasps> oh, my God. Wait, okay. So, no divorce. Why was this so much messy divorce? It's not even a divorce. It was never legal. Clearly, oh, Kit didn't they, know this. With this, they didn't have, It hadn't been, I, I believe, 99%. It wasn't even finalized still. I don't know why. But with this, it was invalid, and it was annulled, and it was bye-bye. You mean Kit and Joan's marriage? Yeah. 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 Was invalid, uh, so bye-bye. Yeah, it was invalid. So, they're like, never mind about the divorce. Kit immediately reported her. And in 2015, a few weeks before the murders, she pled guilty to bigamy and was sentenced to five years probation. Bigamy is when you get married when you're already married. And I know everyone's curious. I actually had to stop myself from digging too much into this. I tried to look up how that's possible. How if you go to the courthouse to get married, they don't check anything. I don't know. Um, but yeah, P.I. Mary is not done with the bomb drops. Oh, shit. She told him that people started coming forward telling her that Joan and Cal Phillips were actually having an affair. Oh. Which oh. this is something Kit says he suspected. But because their marriage, his marriage to Joan was so volatile, he did not care. <laughs> oh, but, my God. Wait, and Cal was going to testify against her? Yes, but we don't know that for sure. I mean, he's dead. They believe he was going to. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Oh, Okay. Cal's family and a lot of friends said, no way, that affair is bullshit. They, that's just small-town gossip. But Mary spoke to two people who somehow witnessed it. Oh. I don't know how or what. Maybe, like, they kissed when they didn't know anyone was around or mm. a stroke of a hand, a loving gaze. An OTPHJ. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Probably. In 2015, shortly before the murders, Mary went to talk to Cal. Oh, my God. The, the private investigator went over to Cal's house. Okay. She actually talked to him twice, showing up both times unannounced and mm -hmm. secretly recording the conversation. I guess Kentucky is one of the states where only one person has to be in yeah. the know if they're mm -hmm. being recorded. Mm -hmm. When they're talking, she straight tells Cal that people are talking about this alleged affair and it's not going to be a good look in the court martial. His reaction to that sort of makes me make up my mind on whether or not they're having an affair to be honest uh -uh. so she says that and he he does not seem surprised by the accusation he doesn't deny it. He, he literally says okay so what <gasps> I, I was like oh i really thought it was all bullshit i don't know though right a, a lot of it, they're just it's split opinion a lot of people think it's bullshit a lot of people think it's true no he's married she's married he should have a bigger reaction if it was yeah. bullshit yeah mm -hmm. so he says so what Mary goes on to tell him that she lied about her son's dad dying, mm -hmm. and she tells him about the bigamy, because that had just happened. Uh, yeah. And Cal is shocked by this. <laughs> now, they, they keep talking, and now he's starting to think that she may be using him to get his testimony against Kit, and even mm -hmm. tells Mary if she is, she'll pay a price. <gasps> wow. Does he know that he's... Who does he think he's talking to? A price, they say. Probably uh, investigator. Okay. He's... Apparently, the, it was like he loved to talk. He would chat with anyone. N he knew they were working for Kit. Oh, okay. He's oh, just chatting. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that makes me really think he was going to testify against her. Yes. So Mary presses Cal more about the child abuse claims that in the picture he told the FBI about when he turned in the laptops and all that. Oh, I remember he was like, mm -hmm. I found this classified documents and I saw a horrible picture. Mm -hmm. And Cal seems like he's wavering a little bit. He's like, I mean, I didn't take the picture. I certainly never saw abuse. I, I would just know what I was told. He just, it, it's not a good, uh, hard accusation. She asked him about his testimony in the upcoming court martial and essentially wants to know whose side is he going to take? And he says, 
I'll I'll reveal that on the stand. I'm not going to do that here. Oh shit. So they don't know a hundred percent that he was yeah. going to. Yeah. But this is why they think he might have. He was he started to not be so much on Joan's side. And mm-hmm. by now, I don't know if the affair was still on. Another source said they like had a falling out. And they really weren't that close anymore. I think she had moved out of the rental. Oh. So uh, it, I don't know. Anyway, when Kit listened to the tape of their conversation, he was 100% convinced that Cal was going to turn on her. Yeah, I kind of am too. Kit gives investigators security camera footage from his house. He's very equipped with surveillance. Yeah. But he actually only has them in, set up in the back because that's the only way to get in and out of the house is through the back door. Apparently, the front door was broken and he had nailed it shut so people would stop trying to use it. Really? Yeah. So they watch the security tapes and you can see him come home after work on the day of the murders and he doesn't leave again. He's seen letting his dog out when it's dark out. And his new girlfriend also confirms that he was at the house all night with her. Oh, wow. Okay. Investigators are still interested in Kit, but there's nothing to arrest him. The DNA Mm -hmm. at the crime scene all belong to the victims. There's just really no evidence. Yeah. Then a month after the murders... Police get a phone call from an employee at AT AT&T. Apparently, Mm -hmm. Joan found a cell phone in her yard and took it in there to see who it could belong to. The employee sees that there's been a factory reset on it. So he pulls up the account, I guess, based, I don't know if there's a serial number on it. I don't know how. But, and he sees that it's registered to Pam Phillips. Oh, okay, wait. Joan found this in her and Kit's front yard? No, her front yard, where she had moved. Oh, where she She moved. moved. Okay somewhere oh she found it in her front yard oh so the employee sees that it's pam phillips and again this triple murder is huge news in this small town so he says like oh my god that's the woman who was murdered i'm calling the police and turning this in and i i don't know how else to describe it other than joan bolts (gasps) she's not sprinting out the door but she immediately turns around and walks out there's security camera of it i'm like Jesus. She's not sticking around for cops to come get it. Now they're suspicious. Investigators are suspicious of Joan and bring her in for questioning, but she has an alibi that checks out. I do not know what it is. I'm sorry. I've looked. I don't know what it is, but apparently it was legit. And again, there's no evidence. So they let her go. Oh my God. In April, 2016, five months after the murders, Matt and his aunt are still at Cal and Pam's house, again, cleaning it out. Oh, God. They found <laughs> what? A letter that said, I did this love kit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The aunt comes across a forty five caliber shell casing on the back porch. And it's huh. very close to the, to the basement door. He was te- Cal was technically found in a cellar, like where you walk kind of oh. under the house. Yeah. And so this casing was found very close to where you would get there. God. They turn it over to police for ballistics testing. And meanwhile, Kit's court martial finally starts in May 2016. The murders delayed it a few more months. That's why it didn't happen in December 2015, like planned. Mm-hmm. Just FYI. Mm-hmm. Jones' kids testified. They were now 12, 15, and 19 years old. They said that Kit had physically and sexually abused them. But Kit's daughter said that the night of their big fight in 2012, she was there, Mm -hmm. when Joan called the cops to report domestic abuse. Joan, stay with me now. Joan told Kit that if he divorced her, she'd ruin his life and, quote, knows how to do it. And she goes on to say that she would just report him for abuse to his commander. Apparently that night, too, this is really where you stay with me. Kit's daughter overheard Joan tell her son Uh to tell police when they got there (gasps) that Kit hit her. (gasps) So she's like, hey. Justin, right? Yes. There you go. Hey, Mm -hmm. Justin, sweet baby boy, my son, my child. Apple of my eye. Um, When the police get here, stick with me. Tell him. Tell them that he hit me. A lot of these cops. Yeah, yeah. But when police got there and asked him, apparently he said, no, he didn't touch her. Oh, baby. I know. He was scared. And they got him alone. I'm sure. She wasn't with him. That's intimidating. Sorry. Men in uniforms are going to intimidate you more than your mom. 
Oh, Sorry. yeah. Kit's defense also talks about her, Joan's lack of credibility with the alive, not dead boy, ex-boyfriend and the bigamy. <sighs> At one point, he says he would never write secret on all of that classified information he wasn't <laughs> supposed to have. He's right. Like, uh, wouldn't totally. have done that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Ultimately, Kit was found guilty of two counts of mishandling classified information and two counts of simple assault, but not guilty on the more serious charge of sexual assault, uh. which was he took as a huge win. He was sentenced to 90 days in jail and was dismissed from the army after serving 30 years. But again, big win on his part because the sexual assault was going to be by far the bi biggest charge. And I want to point out, he says, yeah, w why would I ever write like secret and classified all right. over these things I'm not supposed to have? Regardless of what was written on them, they were still classified information. It actually was. The kill list, emails he shouldn't have downloaded, all these things. Oh, so uh, yeah, that's but true. But it really was classified. Huh. Yeah, that's so. true. He did actually have them in his possession. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I mean, interesting. He, he said, I mean, his stance is that she took them out of his military office and maybe yeah. she brought them home to hide them, wrote that on them. So there'd be a reason she would be suspicious of it. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Yeah. That's his, that's his take. So he serves his three months in jail. And again, he is dismissed from the army. Mm -hmm. After he got out of jail, he went back to normal life. In 2018, he got a job as a pilot with American Airlines and moved to North Carolina. Oh, uh hey. -huh. Cal, Pam, and Ed's case goes cold until four years later. Oh. On May 10th, 2019, Matt, the son, got a call from someone at the attorney, attorney general's office. He had been in touch with the attorney general to keep pushing for the case to be solved. So they, he made a little connection there. Mm -hmm. So he, he sees that they're calling and he answered and they asked where he was. And Matt says, I'm at home in Louisville. And they said, you need to get out of your house in the next 30 seconds, get in your car and start driving in a direction you wouldn't normally drive and call us right back. Shut up. Matt is like, the fuck? Uh -huh. So he gets in his car, jumps on the highway and starts driving towards Cincinnati. He calls them back and they tell him that they're about to make an arrest for the murders. The ballistics test of the 45 shell casing came back and they found it to be a match to Kit's gun. <gasps> They went to North Carolina to arrest him, but he wasn't there. He, they found out he was in Louisville, which is <gasps> why they called him to say, get the fuck out of your house. Oh, my God. Kit was, in fact, in Louisville working. He wasn't there to do anything to Matt. Mm -hmm. The next day on May 11th, 2019, dressed in his American Airlines pilot uniform, uh -uh. Kit was scheduled to fly a plane from Louisville to Charlotte when he was stopped at the gate and arrested for murder arson burglary and tampering with evidence arrested oh. in front of everyone oh my god everyone's like is my plane gonna be delayed now blah, blah, blah. yes for sure pissed. yeah they're all everyone's getting up curious. in arms like, can you can y'all arrest him in charlotte when we land <laughs> <laughs> there are <laughs> cops go. in charlotte can we do we have to do this now yeah his trial started in june 2021 the prosecutor laid out her theory kit didn't this is the theory Kit didn't want Cal to testify at court martial and, and he wanted revenge on him for turning him in because without Cal, there wouldn't have been a court martial. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So he killed him and then went to clean up. And that's when Pam walked in. So he killed her too. Aww, Upon hearing and, her scream, uh, Ed right. ran over to help and he was killed too. They also point to the level of cleanup of the crime scene, which could easily have been done by a highly trained army ranger. So they point to that a little bit. And if it's really down to Joan just framing him, how the hell would she get those two people, dead bodies in that car? Especially a man. I don't know how big Ed is. I don't yeah. know how big Pam is. But like that's and unless neighbors are literally miles away. Yeah. Uh, someone I mean, it would is have seen farm her. country. But yeah. no, their their neighborhood, I mean, they're close enough you would definitely see. Yeah. Close enough where Ed heard a shotgun yeah. and ran They're, over those in houses a were moment's really close. time. Yeah. Yeah. Ed and their house was were pretty close. Kit's cell phone data also came into play. Apparently his phone was very active leading up to the to what they believed the time of the murders were and after it. But during mm. the time that they believed they were all murdered, it was uh. no activity. Mm. He also had an alarm set for one ten AM on November nineteenth, twenty fifteen. 
which prosecutors say that's when he took Pam and Ed and Pam's car to the field and set it on fire. Because remember that guy said he woke up around 2 or 2.15 after he heard those two explosions. Mm -hmm. They then point out, this is ridiculous to me, they then point out that his alarm ringtone for that 110 wake-up call was Top Gun. (laughs) Oh, come on. Which, me, I mean, they're like, that says a lot about what he thinks of himself. I'm like, oh, wow. Nah, that doesn't do it for me. They also poke holes in the fact that he proves he was home with his security camera footage. Again, the camera only showed the back door, which is, he said, the only way to get in and out. But upon further investigation, they found that the front door was fine. It wasn't even nailed shut. There were no nails in it. (gasps) So he could have easily left out the front door and cameras would not have caught it. I had my mind made up and now Mm, I'm confused. I know, that's why I said we're going to chat. A new witness also testified that he saw Kit Martin at the field where the car was found a few days before the murder. Like he was planning uh, it out. Scoping it out. Scoping yeah. it out. This guy mm-hmm. works nearby and just remember seeing that and being like, hmm. But he didn't know him. So it could have not been home, but he, he said it was. Yeah. The biggest evidence came from that forty five caliber shell casing. A ballistics test determined it came from Kit's gun. And just as an FYI, they did find shell fragments where they found uh ed and pam but those ballistics were inco- inconclusive kit takes the stand and says that joan framed framed him she had access to everything that was being used to prove that he did it specifically the 45 pistol and the dog tags yeah why would he leave dog tags at well a that's what scene? he said so regarding the dog tags he sa- he says that he's like why would i commit murder and then leave my dog tags on a top shelf, like almost out of reach. Yeah. It's not like they fell out. It, they couldn't have fallen in this position. They were put there. Right. He also points out that the dog tags were clearly fake. Oh. He thinks that Joan actually had them made because they were on a white string, which if you've ever seen legit dog tags, they're on a ball chain. They would, ne- yeah. they would never be on a white string. Yeah. And the ones found said Kit Martin. That's not his legal name. It's, oh, it's his nickname. Yeah. His dog tags say Christian Martin. Totally. Oh, now I'm all confused again. Ugh. I know. <laughs> I'm exhausted <laughs> with this. Regarding the 45 pistol, Kit said that he usually kept it along with its ammo in his truck, which again, Joan had access to, and she actually often carried it. And she said that during the 2012 emergency protective order hearing after their big fight, she notes during the hearing that he took away, they took away the 45 that she carried for protection. So that's uh, true. She carried it a lot. Mm. The defense also points out that it's very weird that the police didn't come across that shell casing in the beginning of their investigation when they went through the house, the 45. They uh, think yeah. perhaps it could have been planted there. So uh, Joan would, so someone would find it and they would do the test on it and realize it's Kit's gun. Uh, because it was so close to where Cal's body was found. Oh uh, yeah. Where cops like, no, no, no. We scanned that entire area and there's yeah. not a shell case. That would be suspicious from the jump if they actually did. When a- when the aunt and Matt called to turn it in, they were very suspicious. They had at that point even installed security cameras themselves and turned over the footage to police to show the aunt's reaction when she found it. To like make sure no one placed it there. Oh, wow. Like they were like, that seems very weird. That you yeah. found it on the porch next to where Cal was found, and we didn't. But they did miss the other the one. When she wasn't looking for that, she was yeah. merely just cleaning up. Like yeah, they and she were does. I looking. saw it. She like jumps back, and she's like, "What is that?" And she goes to get Matt to get Matt. Oh. He's like, "What is that?" And he said, "That's a <gasps> shell casing." Oh damn! Yeah, and they were like actively looking for shit like that, and they missed it. Yeah, that is sus. Yeah. Kit said that the 1.10 a.m. alarm that day was to check on a new kerosene heater he had recently installed. He woke up to refill it and make sure it was working okay. Apparently, you're supposed to keep the wick wet or something. So he just wanted to check it. Huh. And then he was like, and I like Top Gun, so chill. <laughs> we're not using, we're not going to use the Top Gun thing. I'm not addressing the Top Gun thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's why he got up at 1.10 a.m. I don't whatever and yes i caught the kerosene thing too uh, yeah they, i was about to say huh I, there was no connection to that apparently i mean that's not hard to get anyone could have that but 
yeah, I was like, oh, kerosene, but no one t- t- touches mm-hmm. that one. Okay. If you recall, the fire department could smell the kerosene at the fire, yeah. you know. Uh, the fire of the car. Yeah. Yeah. They also told the court about testimony that Joan's supervisor at work gave during one of the hearings. Apparently, Joan was talking about the murders right afterwards and seemed weirdly giddy about it. No. She's, in fact, she seemed so happy that the supervisor called the police and reported it. No. She said she was disturbed by it. It was weird. She was so that is weird. thrilled. Weird. Lastly, the defense pointed out that Joan had Pam's cell phone. <laughs> Why did she have it? Oh, my God. That's right. I forgot. All the points that Kit's making. Oh, my God. They God, wanted to I'm put confused. her on the stand to answer that question herself, but she pleaded the fifth and didn't testify. Uh, what? God, that, no, nothing. I'm just, I'm on the you're, fence. You're sitting on it? I'm sitting on it, but I've, yeah. The jury deliberated for seven hours, and everyone was shocked when they came back and found Kit guilty of all three murders, one count of first-degree arson, one count of attempted arson, two counts of first-degree burglary, and three counts of tampering with evidence. Oh, he was I was sentenced- leaning more towards Joan. I'm so torn. He I was know. sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. In 2023, they overturned the first-degree arson charge because they couldn't prove that Ed and Pam were alive when he set the car on fire or something. Either way, it didn't change his sentence. So now he's currently serving his sentence at Rotorer Correction, Rotorer, I don't know, Correctional Complex in Louisville, or in Kentucky. I don't think it's in Louisville. Oh, my God. That Isn't is... that insane? So that's the story of Kit Martin and the sad murders of Cal, Pam, and Ed. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm torn. I don't I'm know. I'm so torn. I, I, some, I think I lean towards... Kit didn't do it. Me too. I don't know but why. The Pam, the Pam and Ed thing, I'm with you. I don't get it. Don't so get they it. were shot. She got home ar- just before five, around five. Like, it was daylight. Well, mm-hmm. I guess, yeah. No, it was daylight. I mean, November still. God. And, like, Getting she was on the phone was. with someone. She didn't say a name. No. She, she, Marlene mm-hmm. said she sounded star- very startled. And then it was silent. But she didn't say, like, Damn. oh, Joan. Or, oh. I, I just yeah. can't imagine really either person getting away with killing two people at the house Here. and then I get dragging them to the car. It's yeah, weird. dragging them to the car. So that spawned a bunch of gossip and theories that they were having an affair. That's why they're in the car together. But this, he had a meal set up at his house. He had a full beer. Yeah. Like he was at his house. They weren't like driving in the car together. I don't know. Yeah. So that's all dumb, I think. But and there's I don't copious know. amounts of blood all over that yeah, house. Yeah, there's like, blood all over that they house. They can tell where people are shot. Yeah. That's that. I, I don't, the car thing really confuses me how someone would do that without being seen. <sighs> yeah. Baffling. It'll keep but me But that up. doesn't, that doesn't sway me towards, I mean, I guess Kit would definitely be stronger, but I don't know. Anyway, that one baffles me. And then just all the other stuff, the, the credibility really, Joan really, it's shot. It's shot. I mean, giddy about the murder. I'm like, sh- I don't know. Shut your mouth. What yeah. are we doing? But then the front door is weird, not being that nailed is, shut. Th- yeah, Again. that is weird. I know. <gasps> I know. They're in it together. <laughs> I don't think They're so. Not. They're not. Well, good one. I'll there be up all night. Thank I'll be up you. all night contemplating. All right, patrons. Hey, thanks for joining Brody. Urka, it's spelled E R C U H H H, or I think a bunch of H's. I think I'm pretty sure it's Erica, but it was a funny way to say it. Mm-hmm. Allie, Marcella, Jennifer, Yadi, Sharita, Beth, Katrina, Sarah, Kathleen, Sherry, Lee, Ebony, and Laurel. All right. Thanks, homies. Now I have a custom shout out from someone who doesn't want me to say her name. Thank you so much for this chance to shout out someone who is the best in the world, full of worse, and the best in a world full of worse. Oh, yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Not only did she introduce me to your podcast. Oh, thank she you. is the best. I've read this before and I don't know why. I just, I don't think I realized that it said that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But my friend, who I lovingly call We Tsunami, supported me at the sentencing for a man named Thomas Proctor, who oh. had committed a seri- serial sexual offenses against women, including me. It's totally, she goes in parentheses, it's totally fine. 
I'm still very sorry that you went through that. Oh, my God. We Tsunami met me there with the opening line of, has anyone called you a stupid bitch yet today? They had not. I don't know. I guess that's an inside joke. <laughs> but they oh had. Oh, my God. I was great. like, I'm not going to call you a stupid bitch. No. You're, no. She held my hand as we watched him show no remorse. Scottish oh. law is that none of the people he attacked can be identified. <gasps> that's, I mean, obviously why she doesn't want me to say her name. Yeah. If any other people affected are listening, my heart goes out to you and you are the best. I believe oh. there are more victims and I hope they feel safe now. The <gasps> papers also declined to print my very reasonable comment of fuck that guy. I love that. I I'm like, love how do you feel? That. She's like, fuck that guy. Yes. My wee tsunami makes anything fun and manageable and manageable. And I hope nobody called her a stupid y- bitch yet today. They better not have. They better not have. Go answer she has eyes. good um, podcast recommendations. Yeah. Um, that was very nice. Thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, no, thank you. And God, what a dick. I'm yeah, so fuck glad that guy. That piece of shit's out of here. Can I Google him? Thomas yeah. Proctor. Yeah, there's a BBC article about it. Oh, my God. Well, that's all I got. So thank y'all so much. And thank y'all. And you're the best. People are the worst. See ya. See ya.